For us at EHR, an emergency architecture and human rights is a statement. Architecture is a human right. But we want to open this and try to make us a um, um, question. Is architecture a human right? Architecture is an accumulate knowledge, and all accumulate knowledge has to have the possibility to be used by everybody as much they want, when they want, and where they want. Classrooms, it's one of the main infrastructure that is needed now. Architecture is a tool to promote human rights. We think that architecture is a human right. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone, and um, uh, welcome to this uh, appointment uh, of the ACC lectures. Um, I wish to thank, uh, uh, as always, uh, the, the curatorial team uh, of the PhD students who have organized and curated uh, everything. Uh, thank you also to the students who have produced the video that uh, allowed us to get to know Michele uh, uh, before his lecture. And of course, I wish to thank uh, our guest uh, uh, for today's lecture, Michele Di Marco. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I will be very, very brief in my introduction since uh, uh, the video already gave us, uh, let's say, the, the atmosphere of, uh, of, um, of your intervention, of your lecture. Um, just a few words. So, Michele. Uh, Michele Di Marco defines himself, I, I really like this definition, uh, as a true internationalist uh, who believes uh, in the power of networking uh, and the multidisciplinary approach. Um, he is, uh, in fact, uh, a former student of Politecnico di Torino, where he obtained uh, uh, his bachelor in architecture. In fact, we studied together. And then uh, he moved on uh, to UAV in Venice, uh, in Chile and uh, many other international destinations. Um, Michele is uh, teaching now in several universities uh, on the topics of architecture, human rights, uh, emergency response, uh, and disaster risk reduction. Um, just a few words about uh, his two main activities. Um, from September 2019, after being the director of the international operations for three years, uh, he became the CEO of Emergency Architecture and Human Rights, EHR. Um, the particularity of this uh, practice, of this organization, Emergency Architecture and Human Rights, is that uh, um, the projects that they undertake uh, um, must challenge directly at least one of the 17 sustainable development goals of the UN agenda. Also, Michele is part of the founding team behind uh, TECNE, um, the World Health Organization Technical Science for Health Network, uh, where he works on engineering control for infectious diseases, and he coordinates uh, uh, TECNE members' operations and activities. Uh, okay, so I think that uh, uh, I will uh, definitely leave the floor to Michele now. Thank you again for being here and uh, please.
No, Michele, we cannot hear you. First of all, thank you uh, for uh, um, for for the. Um, sorry, just one second. Because I can hear myself actually. No, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, well, first of all, like thank you for uh, for the introduction, Valeria. And of course, like um, uh, you mentioned, just my name, but like behind all of this, there is uh, there is there is a great team. There is the team of emergency architecture and human rights, and I think this is this is worth it, uh, to mention. Thank you to the Polytechnic of Turin for the invitation to me and uh, to emergency architecture and human rights. But thank you, and most of mostly like to to all of you, to the students who are and will be the beaten art of this university and, uh, and the future society. So many of you today um, will start uh, to think at the relation. What does it mean, this relation between architecture and human rights? And while I'm going through the presentation, I would like that um, all of you um, will have this question in mind. And surely there will be, of course, like many different answers um, to that question and to that combination, to that uh, relation between architecture and human rights. So thinking about um, how architecture is related to human rights give us the possibility of articulating some answers. The point of view that will be presented today, and uh, this at the base of uh, the foundation of emerging architecture and human rights, is what you also heard in the video. It's defined architecture as an accumulate knowledge, and so a tool that everyone has the right to use. And therefore, like if used properly, and I will mention this more and more, if used properly, can be used to defend human rights, to foster human rights. So in different parts of the world and in different historical moments, architecture has been used as a tool for, uh, for social change. And this is the meaning that we are basically built upon what was already existing and happening in the history. And, but today, like let's start, uh, we are in, uh, in the middle of the pandemic that it's uh, affecting uh, the, all over world, the, the whole world. So like today, I want to start with uh, one right, the right, uh, the right to health. And, and this is, I think it's, it's important to understand that, that disease outbreak in cities in general spaces are somehow bonded and they have had a very long relationship. Starting from the, you can see like a photo, like a, sorry, um, a picture here in the presentation, starting from the typhoid fever in Athens on the 4th century, which decimated uh, its population by, by two thirds. The Ansin disease uh, during the, the Middle Age, of course, you know, the Black Death, you know, a spread of, uh, the spread of, uh, of the bubonic plague. And that's, that was spreading actually like around the world and killed around a third of the population of, uh, of Europe and caused the collapse of, this, of the federal system, the economical structure, and the redistribute the demographic. And I mentioned this because it's actually, you know, like what's happening here with the, with the COVID, with this pandemic, is not just a health crisis. And of course, we can continue and continue the seven pandemic, the seven cholera pandemic. We are actually in this moment in the seventh cholera pandemic that was impulsing, as we will see now, like the creation of new sewage and water treatments all around the world. But I want to start like uh, with uh, with this map, with this uh, uh, because, because it's this is very interesting because the map it's at the base of the epidemiological studies. So, starting from the, the story, what is the story about this map? On the thirty first of August, eighteen fifty four, after several other outbreaks that had occurred in in London. A major outbreak of cholera occurred in Soho, in one of the neighborhoods of London. And over the, in three days, just after three days, the 31st of August, 1854, 127 people died around the Broader Street. You can see that there is a point where written pump around there. During the week after, three quarters of the resident had fled the area. People leave. And after 10 days, 500 people like diets with a mortality of around 12.8% in some part of the city. 
So by talking with the residents um, at that moment, um, a doctor was called uh, uh, John Snow, identified the source of the outbreak as the public water pump in Broader Street, between Broader Street and Cambridge Street. That is the dot that you can see in the middle of the map. And it turned out that the water from the pump was polluted by a sewage from the nearby chest pits where a baby nappy contaminated with cholera has been dumped. And thanks to this map, there were major changes and improvements both in the public health and the infrastructure department. But even more, thanks to this map, and so this collaboration between you know, the building environment sector, the understanding of the environment, the space, and the reason behind the infrastructure and the infection disease, so the health, the health part, the public health part, it was understood that cholera is basically a waterborne disease. And we can continue always like stick to London and over decades, uh, the River Thames had effectively become the London largest open sewage. But it wasn't until the great stink, as was called the Thames in that, in that moment for the, for the smell that was emanate. And in the summer of 1854, there was decided, like was, was forced the parliament to close. And of course, the Londoners at that moment decide to do something about it, the city sanitation crisis. And in that moment, actually, uh, and you can see like a small phrase, old smeller disease, because in able to ignore the stank of the Thames, and at that moment, you know, there was a real fearful of the miasmatic belief, a kind of miasmatic belief that all smell are diseases. The parliament sanctioned it, one of the century rest engineering projects. So the all new sewage network for London that didn't exist before. And this, of course, like was connected with the rapid growth of, uh, of London that they did, was not accompanied by the infrastructure improvements. So the huge amount of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of sewage produces each day, it was not going in a parallel way like to the improvement of the infrastructure of the old city. And that was, of course, contributing to the wave of cholera outbreaks and other public health crises, as we, as we mentioned before. And this is something, if you, if you, if you know, like, and if you look it's, um, at what's happening also, like, around the world, it's actually exactly the same that it's happening now and, and was happening from that, that moment. So they decided to build a um, brick wall sewage tunnel which allowed the system to cope with increasing volume of waste. So the new sewage system was opened finally in the 1865. In the following years, that had huge like, contribution of reducing the um, transmission of, of cholera like within the city. And, and that was actually um, so it because the, the main part that it was actually affected by cholera, like in uh, in the in the next years, was just the east of London, the part that actually was not connected to the new sewage system. And if we are flying to the other sides of the of the Atlantic, and we go to the end of the 18th centuries, Philadelphia was the most dense planned city, and at that moment also the capital of the U.S. But at the same time, it was the hottest city and it was of, of uh, like between all the Atlantic sea coast. And the city was surrounded by swamp with open sewage. Liquid and west were uh, basically thrown into all dug into the ground and also captured like rain off. Resident store like the rainwater and barrel. And that was the perfect way of providing breeding ground to the mosquitoes. So all of that was provided like the best way to basically um, transmit what we call yellow fever. And in the 17 of the, the 1793 in Philadelphia between August and November, like Philadelphia became a huge epicenter of uh, yellow fever epidemic. And also in that case, 
what was started, you know, like um, to be done, looking actually at the reason why there was such a huge, huge epicenter, became such a huge epicenter in Philadelphia, is because the city developed exclusively along the, um, the river with a grazing density nearby, nearby the, the, the port where you see actually the red, the red area on the, on the first map on the, on the left. And the density close to a river had deadly implication when mosquito carry out um, like a yellow fever, like from the sheep coming from the Caribbean and sailors were the, actually the one residing, residing in the boarding houses nearby the ports. So in 1793, 10% of the population died. Looking at Philadelphia, the old US, the old United States, the state of America, was doubting if they should become an urban nation or in the authority of Philadelphia were asking themselves how they can reinvent themselves. Can Philadelphia reinvent themselves? And this is actually what they started to do, like with uh, in 1795, where they established a board of public health. And the epidemic results in a number of innovative measures, such the creation, as you can see in the map, of five parks that help reducing stagnant water and the first municipal water system in the country. So again, you can see that because of a pandemic, because of an epidemic, like there is, when there is a strict relation with, with another discipline and working in a multidisciplinary way, of course, considering also the transformation of the space, there are very big invention and there is, um, there is a new way of rethinking and improved conditions. So in this an extraordinary, like innovative vision of the progressive technology and civitas. So, and of course, an amazing answer to who at the beginning, do you remember the question, can Philadelphia reinvent themselves? You know, and the other question, can the US um, should become uh, um, uh, a city, nation or not? And yes, of course, you know, like the answer was the, through the innovation vision of uh, Philadelphia, like that actually the US needed the city. And of course, Venice, you know, from where the, the word quarantine is coming from. Many of us, you, you heard this, uh, this, uh, these words millions of times during, uh, during the last years. So the word quarantine actually is coming uh, from uh, quarantine, as is meaning like the, the 40 days. And it was used in the 14th and the 15th centuries, like by Venetian, to designate the period that all ships were required to be isolated before like passengers and crew, but also um, um, the staff. Um, so to assure like during the Black Death plague epidemic. So in the middle of 14th century, Venice was stuck by the, the um, bubonic plague that we were mentioned at the beginning, part of the outbreak known as the Black Death. So this spread was just one of the several waves of the plague that struck the, struck the north of Italy in the century and that followed Venice as a trading center. So Venice was really like affected because it was the trading center of that area, especially, and was start to become extremely vulnerable to that. So when at the beginning of the 15th century, the devastating plague outbreak hit Venice and killed the Doge, it was actually the head of the state at the time, it was called Giovanni Moncenigo, like Venice government built a public hospital in Lazzaretto Vecchio. So to isolate infection and curb like the disease of, of the disease. So the Senate like decides um, at that moment to convert and transform an island the Venetian, within the Venetian lagoon that was called Santa Maria di Nazareth to host the first in the world hospital to treat plague infection, infected people. So give them a place to quarantine, but also at the same time, as was mentioned before, to decontaminate, to decontaminate goods. And after the period of 65 years, it was built another um, and other facilities that was called Lazzaretto Novo. And 
it became obligatory, like it became mandatory stop for every ship arriving to the region in order to get L check. So thanks to this policy, Venetians were able to curb the damage as the plague struck Europe again and again during the all, all Renaissance. So together, this island were, became the center of the Venetian vast public health response to the plague and building on early tradition of separating the, um, the sick from the healthy, the Venetian government became the first in the Mediterranean region to systematically like, use large scale methods of isolation and information collecting and monitoring and to fight the infection disease. This is actually what's, what it's happening in a different way, of course, um, like now during, uh, during the pandemic and during any epidemic. So the effort was even more impressive because at that time, the science didn't explain, couldn't explain how disease spread. The germ theory, theory is actually was discovered 400 years after. So Venice became the corner store, was the corner store for the creation and development of isolation facilities around the globe from major public building to entire islands, as we saw with the Lazaretto Novo and Lazaretto Vecchio, serving the old health infrastructure system. So like this was actually like one of, uh, um, of, of the main and the first way to rethink in space because an infection disease, because an epidemic or an, uh, an a pandemic. And I want to pass, of course, to another right, the, the right to housing and the right to live. So beginning with the Industrial Revolution, several um, utopians and activists in the United States and, of course, the United Kingdom warned and fought um, for the right to housing, the right to work, the pursuit of health and well-being in the urban life in general, which was at the base for a series of urban movements that after were developed during the 20th and 21st centuries. And this is like a, a picture of, uh, of Ancot, uh, the Ancot area in the city of Manchester, and was one of the, that was one of the first industrial uh, suburbs in the, in the world, made up of small the Russet houses where workers from, um, from the nearby area, like where uh, uh, basically where the workers were moving from the countryside into the, into the city to start working into the um, nearby factories. So in the 1878, the worker political started a worker political mobilization and sanitation effort to rebuild the working class neighborhoods, led them to participation in the local election and under the leadership of actually a very interesting person that is called Charles Robley, who became the um, like the started, you know, and the rethinking the unhealthy area of Ancot. It was like a very interesting and successful campaign to achieve better living standard, healthy homes and environments. And of course, Copenhagen, because our organization is actually based in, in Copenhagen in Denmark. And in Copenhagen, the overdensification and poor condition of um, working class housing as a result of the explosive growth of, of the population in, within the walled city produces a cholera epidemic in the, in the 1853, which influences the need to dismantle the fortification in Copenhagen. So it was a delayed decision as for decades it was being considered an urgent need. As a result of the epidemic, a new meat market and safer water supply, supply was built in the 1857. And the society completed the first stage of housing projects considered the birth of social housing in Denmark. So in the 1890, the first Danish national legislation was passed to provide cheap home loan aimed at work association. And that is interesting because actually happened like much before um, the, um, the booming of the social housing that actually happening after the Second World War, where there was the need of building uh, affordable um, houses in a very in a very fast manner 
And of course, the devastation, the herbicides, the product of the World War II led to a global movement for social rights. The United Nations General Assembly on the 10th of December 1948 adopt the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is actually what our organization, Emergency Architecture and Human Rights, is building upon, which is the document that direct decision-making, public policy of the country and the effort civil association in the world. The Article 25, that actually is the direct link and the first link between architecture and, and human rights, indicate that all people have the right to an adequate standard of living that ensures them as well their family, health and well-being, food, clothing, housing, medical assistance and necessary social service. Of course, this is the direct, when it's talking about shelter, it's talking about protection, but all of that, it can be, as we mentioned before, is the right to health, is the right to living adequately. So between the 1950s and the 1970, I was mentioned before, the were built was the boom or booming of the social housing construction, were built 40 million houses within Europe. 34 million in the east of Europe and 6 million in the west of Europe. So this was an, a need, an urgent need that there was, because there was a need to rebuild a continent, an entire continent in a fast and affordable way. And after the, the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s, with the influence of the neoliberalism, and of course, um, the Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, that the most influencing architect passed from working in, from the public sector to the private sector. Everyone, the new graduate, want to become archistars because it's what we were teaching into the university, pushing so the cold public or social architecture in its own darkest period. But of course, all of this, you know, history, it's are like, are like waves, our approaches tend to be like waves. And in 2000, a new interest in social architecture, um, like boom and out, which can be observed in international competitions such as, or international like exhibition, such as like the, Vienna, the, the Venice Biennale, the Documenta in Castle, the Hart exhibition, Documenta in Castle, stated as a South at State of Mind, or the um, Venice exhibition, the, sorry, the Venice Biennale, Less Aesthetic, More Ethics. And of course, the Pritzig Prize um, as a symbol to Alejandro Ravenna and Shigeru Ban for their project of social impact and public interest. But what about now? What's happening now in our historical moment? So this year, there has been a radical change in the way we inhabited our city and our home during the pandemic, as we all were affected, actually. So with approximately 90% of the all COVID cases reported in urban area, like urban area have became um, the epicenter of the pandemic. The size of the population and their high level of global and local interconnectivity, as we remember was the case of Venice, and is why it was so vulnerable to the plague, make them particularly vulnerable to the spreading of the virus. So in short term, for many cities, the COVID-19 health crisis has expanded, as was in the case of Europe during the the bubonic plague during the Black Death into a crisis of urban access, urban equity, urban uh, finance, security, unemployment, public services, infrastructure, transportation, and all of which is disproportionately affects the most vulnerable population in society. So this crisis has made us reflect on whatever city as we know now as we know them now, like are an obsolete systems that require major transformation. 
So as we saw in our history, various disease, plague, war, um, or catastrophes, disaster in general, have made us reorganize cities, create new system, create new typology. And in the same way, this pandemic has made us um, thinking about questioning the place and the way we work, where we study, leisure spaces, how we, the commerce develop and how we inhabit our home, our, our uh, uh, private spaces. But at the same time, this makes us um, rethinking about density and extension of cities and about the elements or pieces that compose all of this. So they are the building, the park, public spaces, streets. But, you know, during 2020 and from when the pandemic starts, you know, the there were like a lot of webinars about post-COVID cities and how this post-COVID cities be like. So the pandemic actually, like in fact, a small virus called SARS-CoV-2 has exposed the fragility, fragility of infrastructure and urban services in much of the city, making the deficit carry over decades evidence. This is not something that is coming because or just because the pandemic. The pandemic presented as an opportunity to correct all of that, or at least to transform some of that, especially in the most vulnerable sector. So before the pandemic, um, there was already the idea of creating a city where all needs were covered by the famous um, 15 minutes walk city. So this distribution could, of course, like solve uh, several of the problems in the city, distributing the uses in many, in, in more like an equitable way in the, in the territory. With the pandemic, the idea um, of metropolis as a system of interconnected and self-sufficient neighborhoods has emerged as a possibility to stop future pandemic or at least to limit the transmission in future pandemic and be a, a catalyst for decentralization. But in addition, the pandemic made visible that the need uh, to improve the quality standards of home, common spaces, our streets, our health facilities. And just as the hygienist theory influences modernist aesthetic, for example, in the case of tuberculosis, um, where sanatorium, bathroom, large green area were designed out of the fear of diseases, this pandemic has made us reflect on the need for fresh air, more balconies, wider sidewalks, private outdoor, public and private outdoor spaces. And public spaces and green area have been seen as the place to communicate. If, like there was very interesting analysis done, for example, in Denmark, looking at the booming of the use of public spaces during the, um, the, the pandemic times. So share and carry out, like a place where to share and carry out activities, reducing the, scare, the, the risk of transmission uh, that is, of course, higher when we are talking about indoor spaces. But I also believe that we must go beyond all of this and understand that the, the, the crisis, the crisis as a structural problem of urban inequality. So as we saw in the last month, this is not a normal time. And in, sorry, the last month, not, not the last one. In the last month, this is not, um, um, this is not, like a normal time. So what we do in the next years, we let go through the generation that will come after us. So today I also want to introduce into the discussion what I actually introduced before. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is still, at least for us, but for many, like the North Star that should guide our generation and the future generation that will come. So we must bet on cities that inspire and mobilize others to overcome, overcome treats such inadequate health system, gaps in the social protection, structural inequality, 
environmental degradation, degradation, climate crisis, that unfortunately we are tend to forget during uh, the pandemic. So COVID-19 is shining, um, we can say, uh, a spotlight on this, on this injustice. So we've been brought to our knees by a microscopic virus. The pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of our world. And definitely, we can say that inequality define our time. So foods, healthcare, water, sanitation, education, decent work, social securities are not commodity to sell to those who we can afford them, but are basic human rights to which are, we are all entitled. So that vision is important today as it was 73 years ago when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written. So part of our collective memory can be seen in our city, the way we build and the way our urban life unreveals its products of past experience. We easily forget as the time passes, but many of the measures we take to reduce seem to be more and more forget, forgotten. So therefore, beyond learning from the past, we must be prepared for the future. And this is a big possibility for now in this moment. We must put resilience at the center of our culture while framing it as a right and not only the right to the city, but the right to a healthy city. And I want to end this, this, this chapter of, uh, of, the, uh, of the presentation with, uh, with a poem written by a good friend and a brilliant professor from the Copenhagen University, it's called Emmanuel Raja. And he wrote this poem just at the beginning of the pandemic. And this actually say, I left my home, my people and my land, searching for a ray of hope, a light through the tunnel. I fled poverty and marginalization. I fled looking for hope. I met a bed in a slum, as they call. I shared the shower with a million others. I shared my space with 10 others. Space. Yes, just a 15 square meter and a loft with another few men. Under the sheets of tin, we cooked, we ate, and we worked. Fire and flood, who care? The virus come, they care. Not about me, but the virus might come into their home. Told me to stay home. They call it, it social distancing. They get paid for that. I don't. And if we all stayed home in the slum, how, we, how do we distance? Clean water. I never saw that before. How do I wash my hands for 20 seconds without water? I don't get to eat because I have to stay home. What do I do? Walk home, no matter to the distance. It was a few hundred kilometers I succeeded, no matter the heat. I collapsed one, some water came, then some food. Thank you, good Samaritan. Then come the barricade to stop me, the migrants. Then come the sanitizer for the buses, but they spread on me. Then come the cane, the police parade of power asking why I'm walking. Because I cannot work from home. And if I don't work, I don't eat. They closed the border and they sacked of my real home gone. Even if I had the virus, nobody cared because I've left the city. No water, no soap, no distancing. Unemployed, unpaid, and starved. The poverty, my, dusk, my darkest fear that I fled. I see it coming again, but I walk home, the long walk home. And so, I think it's very clear after, after that, that is not just about health crisis. So what post-COVID city be like? The truth is that they will be very similar to current city if the political, economical model and decision-making are not discussed. There will be no fair city if the privatization of social rights and common goods is not reversed, if democracy is not radicalized and if everyone is not recognized as equal in the city. 
And we can say that city is an inherently political, ideological, social product, and putting it in a preferably technical sphere of neo hygienist urban planning will not will be nothing more than a new infertile reflection. We will also realize that it cannot be a discussion between politician and technician, it must be built collectively in a multidisciplinary manner. It is then the time to rethink the answer, but of course, and most than everything, to rethink the questions. And then we'll pass to the last rights um, of, uh, of today. There are many more, but we don't have enough time. Um, and I would like to end the right of education. One of the most important rights, if we don't to lose the future generation, if we want to foster all the other rights. Emergency Architecture and Human Rights launched this year in the middle of the pandemic, the Classroom for All initiative. And the reasons will be very clear in the next slide that I will, uh, I will show. More than 170 million children are not enrolled in pre-primary in pre education, missing a critical investment opportunity and suffering deep inequality from the start. From a very interesting UNESCO report, a very interesting UNESCO report states that only six on 10 children leave primary school without achieving minimum proficiency level in reading and math. Today, there are 1.2 billion young people between 15 and 24 years which account the 16% of the whole global population. But in 2030, the, the same, looking at the same age range, the, the projection will grow to 1.3 million. Moreover, building and the keep the facility, physical facilities for educational purpose, account as the second large element of the education system after the, teaching, the, the salary of teachers. So in the emergency context, the limited financial input led the humanitarian agency to invest the fund into educational activities rather than the facilities themselves. So Classroom for All, I was mentioned before, it's a multi-stakeholder um, initiative that aimed to increase access to quality education through the improvement of learning facility for children living in vulnerable settings. So by promoting local-led response, um, it works to strengthen like the, the local community's resilience and capacity, uh, uh, the local community capacity and, and, and resilience to manage the risk and opportunity in the face of recurrent crisis in vulnerable setting. Are they crises uh, um, like due to the, um, the natural hazards or pandemics, epidemics, conflicts, etc. So the initiative does not only aim to provide um, classroom that are safe against natural hazard, infection, disease, etc., but also to educate and to share knowledge with the local community to basically make them resilient to all these challenges. So a safer classroom can save the life of children, but at the same time, it can provide a safer space for the local community in a time of an emergency, a flooding, an earthquake, et cetera, serve as a temporary shelter <coughs> while the community is basically wait to, um, for normalcy and like after, after the disaster. But the process behind the implementation of each project for us is as important as the reason why we are doing and the final result. So as we said, we provide safe and quality education space and learning facility for children, but at the same time, we are trying to strengthen resilience of local people living in vulnerable setting. So all of that is possible thanks to all participatory engagement activities capacity building training and awareness activities on adaptation that are done during the process. So, and of course, like finalizing on the co-construction activities, 
through employment following the mechanism of cash for work. But of course, design, when it's, it's an extremely important aspect when talking about disaster risk reduction, it's a fundamental element. It's not the only one, but it's a fundamental element. And it's for this reason like, that, um, that, um, that to reduce the cost and the response time, we are working and building a matrix to facilitate the design process, both in the technical part and during the co-design together with the, and use, and they can be used during the co-design do, um, together with the, with the local community. The matrix is extremely useful to speed up the process in the case of an emergency, because like, but at the same time, like without forgetting um, like the area where we are going to implement the project or where the intervention will be done, will take place. So the matrix also help us to choose the right local material, the low tech construction like available in the area to face and they can able to respond and to increase the resilience of the building infrastructure to uh, the different hazards. So together actually with the Polytechnic of Turin, um, we started a series of, uh, um, of, uh, of theses. Um, the first one was on, uh, on the participation and the other four that actually are ongoing um, will be on the, uh, the use of, uh, of, um, um, of material and, and material and, uh, and technology. So we're, we are now developing a, a model uh, that could be adapted to different area and intervention based on culture, climate, and different hazards. The first prototype will be actually built in, uh, in Kireka, in uh, nearby uh, Kampala um, in Uganda. And together with the local organization, it's called she for she we are working on providing safer spaces where girls and women can learn about um, menstrual health as one that is one the main reason why girls, for example, lose class days in the so-called uh, in the so-called uh, period of shame. So when they have actually the menstrual period, she for she it's our partner. It's it's working hard from several years on this topic, and now is the time for them to have a learning center where to advocate around this topic, and at the same time the facility will host um, a menstrual pad production area where the women from the community will have the possibility to increase their livelihood through the production of the textile and the reusable menstrual pad. Of course, as stated before, like also in the case of Uganda, um, it's extremely important to provide safer educational spaces. So of course, we are going to use the matrix and we are looking now at the different challenges within the area um, going and spanning from natural hazards, are they like geophysical, so for example, earthquake, landslide, hydrological, so for example, flood, climate, uh, meteorological, like cyclone storm, but at the same time biological, so for example, disease epidemic, infection disease, etc., etc. So this is the matrix um, a result. Uh, it's just a draft still uh, for Uganda. And that is for us always the first step of the design process where we choose material and techniques will be able to will able us to go into technical detail to face the hazard. So the color one icons are the one we take into consideration and the gray one are the ones that we discarded because they are not relevant to the topic, to the, to the, to the place. So as mentioned, as the beginning of the classroom for all, um, classroom for all, it's, um, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative where are involved the humanitarian, the private and the academic sector. In a time of rapid change, it is impossible to work alone. I think it was very clear during the whole presentation. It's, uh, it's impossible to simplify complexity. We have to deal with complexity and the only way to do it is in a multidisciplinary manner. So to finalize today, what I would like to ask you is to believe that together we can build better and healthy cities and environment. 
But here it was no single organization can do. This requires active participation. So I ask you to work together as we already started, for example, in the case of Polytechnic of Turin with the Classroom for All initiative. Today, I ask you to believe in your personal collective capacity to assume your own responsibility as a citizen before than as a professionals. We have to work together. We have to think and solve the challenges of, um, of our time together if we want healthier cities and healthier spaces that can be resilient to pandemic, they can be resilient to different natural hazards, and it can increase more than everything equality and foster human rights. We belong to each other, we stand together, or we fall apart. Thank you. Ah, okay, thank you so much, Michele. Uh, <clears throat> thank you really for uh, uh, an inspiring lecture, I would say, that really took us uh, across the map of uh, a geographical map and also a time map. And uh, that uh, uh, particularly prompts us to, to reflect on and discuss uh, the agency of architecture as a social tool, no? to rethink architecture as a social tool. Um, so I, I would have a, a million questions, but uh, I would like to leave the floor to the students. Uh, I know for sure that there are some students who will have questions, but of course I prompt all of the others to join in the discussion as well. Uh, please, if you want to open your cameras and mix. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, can I start? Sure. Yes. Uh, okay, I am from Group 25. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Michele to the, for the speech. And uh, I have a question uh, for him. Uh, as you mentioned, in the 20th century, this, the social housing projects increased to solve the housing deficit. Some of these projects with the pass of the time were abandoned and demolished, like poorly Lock in the USA, designed by Minoru Yamasaki. And even today in uh, Latin American countries, the government builds social housing projects for vulnerable communities and these are abandoned or had problems of insecurity among others. So which strategies or methodologies must be implemented to guarantee quality of life and resilience of these kind of projects throughout the time and people's lifestyles, lifestyle change? Yeah, thank you for, uh, uh, for the question, Lina. Um, I think, uh, mm, you know, like the, the challenge of like the, the, the social housing, it's, it's span from um, the construction sites, the social sites, um, and at the same time, um, culturally. You know? I was working for quite a bit, for example, in Chile. And uh, one of the main um, problem when talking about, not always, fortunately, but sometimes, when talking about social housing, especially um, like when uh, <clears throat> like moving people, the resettled people from informal settlement to uh, affordable housing, was that <clears throat> like there was a completely destruction of the social connectivities when passing from the informal settlement, when everyone is fighting for the a common objective that is basically to have good affordable housing, when they're passing to really having the, the, the house in itself. So first of all, it's how we are including the people and the community in the use and in the design of this social housing. If we are talking about existing social housing, you know, of course, this uh, social housing they have, you know, more or less in, in Europe, 70 years. So of course they are in need of uh, um, restoration. Uh, 
And another place where I was working, for example, in Latvia, in the case of microrayon, that it's, it's not just about the construction and society, but it's also about um, economics, you know? So basically, <clears throat> this social housing, because we were built 70 years ago, they are now nearby the center of cities. So in very valuable land. And what's happening there, right? Of course, there are private investors that want to rethink these spaces because, for example, the microrayon have like a very big courtyard that was actually the social space for people. That this being an empty part will be very good for the private investor to build on the top. So it's always like a kind of mix between the private investors, the, um, uh, the people living there and the community and what is the, um, uh, the government, municipalities, and of course the designer or architect together with all the dis different stakeholder as a role as a kind of mediator into that. But, you know, to really, if you really want to um, uh, talk about strategy, you know, the main thing is that we cannot exclude any of these stakeholder if you want, not even the private sector, you know, because it's where there is the money, the and the and the majority of like the knowledge in relation with construction for example so like all these elements have to be at stakeholder have to sit around the table to discuss and find the common balance between the wish of all the different actors but of, like it's extremely important to involve the community at the same time thank you so much Mikael. Uh, I can ask a question now, I think. Yes. My question is more about the logistics of how this works. Uh, because in all around the world, there are so many natural disasters and so many uh, immig immigration problems. How do you assess these uh, communities that are in need and how do you choose and reach out to them? to mm -hmm. uh, implement the project? Well, um, first of all, there is no natural disasters. There are natural hazards. Um, because uh, natural hazard became a disaster just when, uh, uh, you know, like there is, it was very interesting uh, um, um, worker Muslims like in Nepal, actually one time told me, the problem is not the earthquake. The problem is that the roof is falling on the on the head of people. Um, but in relation with that, you know, of course, there are several international organizations. For example, there is a very interesting organization agency. This is called UNDRR. That is basically like set um, the assess and set um, like standards and way of working with disaster risk reduction. And of course, like we as an international organization, we cannot work and we, we are not actually interested in working alone without a local partner. So it's really a close relationship between the international organization and the local partners. Of course, like when, uh, um, when you are asking about how you choose it, and how you prioritize. Of course, like um, uh, there are two main elements. Um, one is who is more in need. And that, you know, like you can find several reports that are done. Um, but at the same time, it's um, what is, what could be funded for our speciality um, in emergency circulatory and human rights. Because of course we cannot solve the problem of the world. We are just like a um, small piece of a very big mosaic. But what we are trying to do is basically to really trying to capacity building and, and strength the resilience of the local community so that in, uh, in theory and in the best scenario, 
there will be in the future no needs of emergency architecture and human rights. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your lecture. It was very informative and we've been very looking forward to it. Um, so during the lecture, um, you mentioned several important topics which are connected to each other and you emphasized their urgency in working together in order to establish a collaborative network. So my question would be, how do you think we can achieve the multidisciplinary collaboration in order to establish the necessary urban infrastructure for epidemic control in the post-COVID city? That is an interesting um, question, thank you. And uh, actually, like exactly because that was missing, <clears throat> like what we are um, trying to do, like within you know the, the other job, like at the World Health Organization is to um, basically um, created a network is called Techne, Technical Science for Health Network, where there are universities and, uh, um, and technical institutions that are, uh, support the World Health Organization in supporting different ministry of health, different UN agencies. Um, and within the group, of course, there are engineers, there are architects, there are epidemiologists, there are medical doctors, there are uh, urban planners, and that's, it's, there are sometimes anthropologists, um, wash experts, etc. And this is extremely important, but you know, like I think the main thing, um, if I can suggest something, like while you are uh, um, in your study, is basically to be curious on everything that is not strictly related to your background. You know, because now we are talking about health, but we can perfectly talking about urban farming, you know, and what does it mean about you know, knowing about sustainable farming? And, you know, we, I can go on with many, many of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this example. You know, all this, you know, we have to be a bit more multidisciplinary ourselves to work in a multidisciplinary way. And, and this, I think, it's, uh, it, it was, was the, the old way of, uh, of, of thinking the job of the architects, of course, is going um, like more and more into the specialization. But the architect was, was a kind of um, um, a actor that knew about, about several topics. And that's like openness um, of our profession, I think is extremely important, extremely relevant like nowadays, because the world is becoming too complex and is going too fast that it's impossible to deal just with one discipline. It's literally impossible. Thank you. Mm, hi, hello. So I actually have a um, question perhaps related to the pace of how um, urbanization is changing currently in the world that um, urban analysts are saying that by the end of 2050, um, most of the world population will actually move to the urban, like 75%, some huge number like that. Um, what are some measures that designers and architects or students uh, should aim for for the next three decades? in terms of to um, revive the gap between the socio-economical classes uh, that has been happening for a, almost a century now? Uh, there is actually um, one of the board member of uh, Emergency Architecture and Human Rights called Kim Kleschmidt. He was uh, the camp manager of Zaatari Camp, very high ranking the UNHCR um, um, yeah, worker. Um, that is developing together with, uh, uh, with another group um, what is called Sustainable Development Zones. And um, it is basically um, how you are um, already trying to map where 
people, because of the migration um, that is due to climate change, um, economic, um, et cetera, et cetera, like will go and try to um, think how the city in itself as a connected body can be receptions to di like different kind of people coming into the city. So already start preparing the city for the newcomers. Uh, and this is, you know, something that, you know, we all know from 20 years that the, the, the urban population will, uh, um, will, uh, will increase exponentially. But what we are doing, what we were doing until now, is very little. Also, the other thing is, you know, how we can think decentralization. And this is nothing new. Eh? Like, like he, all, all the um, um, all the nice small uh, cities and villages that you see around Europe, in France, in Spain, in Italy, uh, you know, this medieval village, they were slums or informal settlement outside the city wall. After the city wall, why they were there? Because they could work there, they could farm for the people living inside, or because there was the castle, or because there was the abbey or the church, etc. After the wall expands, they enter within the, the wall, the city wall, and of course, they change. They will not be anymore built in wood, but they were start to build in to be built in uh, in bricks. This is actually exactly the same that it's happening in many informal settlements around the world. Exactly the same process. You know, like if you are looking at, I know, like the informal settlement in Chile or in Argentina, it's very different from the informal settlement you can see in Rio de Janeiro, for example, Rosinha. You know, so, and all this, it's, um, it's something that it's, we all know where it's going. It's just, you know, how we can create this kind of sponge-like um, cities that can be able to um, absorb, um, like, the influx of people. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Are there others among the students? Well, can I? Uh, thank you for your lectures. And uh, my question is related to classrooms for all. Uh, you already answered my question, but I will ask anyway. <laughs> so my question is, how can we structure and organize the participation of young people in this project? For example, what is the key element uh, to make them uh, actors, but at the same time, the end users, the key element. Thank you. Uh, when you're talking about young people, you're talking about the beneficiaries or all of you, for example? Uh, uh, all of them, uh, the, the, the workers, but the, uh, the children's. Okay, the beneficiary. Okay, yeah. Um, of course, like we, um, the participation is not starting from the design. The participation is starting from um, a, a core assessment. Let's say, what are the challenges? You know, it's very easy to say you have these challenges and are going to solve your challenges that I know from here. Of course, you can do a desk research to have an understanding, but after it's very important um, to go to the field and do like what we call what what not what what the Red Cross is called vulnerability capacity assessment. So it's a it's a series of tool um, that are using used um, to assess and set the, to to let the the, the community self assess what are their needs. This is the first step, and after of course like we can pass to the co creation to the design co creation process. In the case of Classroom for All, it's not like a 100% um, uh, co-creation process, but just because we want to arrive 
to more to much people as possible. So basically, there are a certain part that is fixed, that is based on the matrix, because it's basically technical part. So how a structure with a certain kind of material will resist to a cyclone, right? There are some technical things that we can already, as part of the matrix, can, can develop. But there are certain other parts that are where, where the co-creation part in the design and in, uh, in, in all the different tools within the assessment are, are extremely important to basically um, like increase the, the ownership of, of the communities. Because at the end, we are going to leave at a certain point after the, the evaluation process and is the community or the local and the local organization that we are working with always, they are going to stay and use the infrastructure or use the, the, the facility itself. So there are different times um, for engagement and participation. And of course, there are different age at the same time. For example, with the, with the workers, of, um, there is all the element of training capacity building in local material, in the use of local materials, in, to use local material in a safer way. Uh, but with the children, for example, and we are we we can work uh, as, for example, we did uh, with the uh, with the thesis of uh, of, of Julio, um, that a uh, student from Protecting of Turin that was working with us, um, like on how to engage through games, um, like the the children's. So, but it's not just an engagement. But at the same time, this is a learning process. So, for example, you are teaching them like how you can uh, increase the resilience through like small games um, and small drawings, like funny drawings, like how you can increase the resilience of a house, for example, or whatever, like to flooding or to earthquake. Very simple solution, like two very small models, um, et cetera, et cetera but a different tool that can be used. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, thank you for the lecture. In the last year, it has been designed thinking and designing architecture and environments with more and more common space intended for coexistence and the society between the, the people. But after born the, um, one year of um, the spread of pandemic and the social distancing, uh, will, we the, will the way the, of the signing change or uh, once of the crisis has passed, will, will we go back to planning as uh, before? Good Thank questions. <laughs> Well, like I hope, uh, as was mentioned before in the presentation, that we are learning from what is happening, from the, knowing that it's not the first and will be not the last time that a pandemic or epidemic will happen. Um, there was tuberculosis, Spanish fever, just to talk about the cholera, just to talk about the last one. Um, and this is just looking at, at Europe. Because, for example, in certain countries in Africa, they are every year. And now, for example, we are uh, we are working uh, um, on like a Ebola crisis in uh, in, uh, in Guinea and Sierra Leone, etc. I hope that this will change. I hope that the design will change. But I think it's not just a matter of design; it's, to, it's, it's a mindset that should be changed. You know, like if I have to. Um, design a school, I want in my group people that are not just architects and engineers. This first step, it's, it's actually quite important. And after, of course, there will be better design, like less, but like less, less good design, but this is okay, this is what's happening in uh, in uh, in general in our in our business in general right but is the mindset that should be changed you know like 
depending on what I have to build, I have to partner with people that are related to, to, to what the user will do in that space. Will be, for example, extremely strange to build, even on the side of the pandemic, you know, like build a school without listening to teachers. This is something that should never happen. You know, it's, it's, will have to be like completely strange in the near future to design indoor spaces without thinking about, about ventilation. You know, it's happening with tuberculosis, with, with like through the old hygienist period. It's happening again now with COVID. So it's a recurrent thing. You know, um, water and sanitation, like we should never like build anything that is not taking consideration the way you are cleaning the space or the access to water. We should never build anything that doesn't take in consideration um, the possible hazards that, that are there. You know, if I have a tsunami prone area, it doesn't make any sense that I'm planning a city on the coast board, on the coastline. If I have uh, an earthquake prone area, it doesn't make any sense that I'm building without thinking about how the structure will resist, about flooding. You know, maybe should, that my structure should be elevated uh, if I don't have the money to control the, the water flow as in many, in many developing countries. So all of this, um, it needs a multidisciplinary approach, but it needs a different mind setting. We should think about, not just about how beautiful is the object that is important, but is not the only thing. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, when emergency architecture fails uh, to help in some places, uh, uh, maybe due to lack of money or lack of interest uh, from the mass media, uh, the people decide to act independently to have uh, their own right to housing. And, and this is how many slums were born. Uh, my question is, uh, wh what is the best way to intervene in these realities uh, characterized by an architectural structure already consolidated? Hmm. Uh, I think it was three years ago or two years ago, I don't remember. And they invited us to uh, Escola Cidad in uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, for a um, 10 days um, workshop. And I met a very interesting student. Um, she was uh, like living uh, in uh, informal settlements in, uh, uh, in Sao Paulo. And actually like while studying, her work was uh, to share the knowledge that she was acquiring with the community. And there was, we went, we went with her uh, one day. It was extremely small intervention, uh, but that were improving the, the standard of living of the family and the, and the people living within the housing itself, for example. You know, like one of the main problems, for example, in formal settlement and also in area for like the Palestinian camp in Lebanon, where we are um, working, um, is health problem that are uh, due to um, respiratory problem because there is no sun and there is not enough air, right? And this is the same thing in whatever very dense spaces. So one of the things that she was actually doing is to try to understand how the ventilation was working and the trying to improve the ventilation system in not thinking at the apartment itself, but thinking about the old building with the very, very cheap solutions. 
So basically, she was putting together if there was a problem, if if one family was having a problem, she was putting together the the community of the building and working together to try to solve the problem, for example, ventilation or um, um, toilets, you know, sewage system. Of course, to do a sewage system or entire slum, an informal settlement, you need huge investments. That, of course, it needs World Bank, um, government support, like very big investor. And not all the time governments want this investor to put that because it's meaning that you are consolidate legally like the people to stay there. So, and this is the same that's happening, for example, in refugee camps. So this small intervention, there was a super interesting uh, like uh, project done in, uh, in India, if you remember, just with the light. So like they were using chlorine and water and they were creating light inside, just inside bottles. This small intervention that it's also can go to the scale of the product design, they can have a huge impact when you don't have big investments. But you can do that just if you are working extremely closely and for a long time with the local uh, population. Because it's very difficult to come from out. For example, the, may, the majority of these small interventions, successful intervention, are done by um, people that are have like live in the country, right? You know, they, it's, it's their, like it, they, they know the challenges and they, will, uh, and they will solve it. And maybe our support can be just the technical part. How we can improve the idea that they have technically. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> He's gone. Michele, can you hear us? Yeah. I'm here, but uh, I don't know why the other device doesn't work. It's fine. <laughs> I'm coming back here. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Yeah. We can, I can hear you, so you can shoot the other question if you want. Okay. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I can uh, uh, read a question that was uh, written on the YouTube chat. Um, if you hear me, I can read it. It's on the yep. in our chat. Um, Alejandra Rivera asks, uh, how do you recommend to try to reconcile private investors' economic interests in the built environment with community interests of protection of social and human rights in the same setting? Mm -hmm. There are different ways. Um, um, and every, everyone is, have to, is, is different depending on the location, of course. Um, but it's an old uh, thought to believe that development can be done without the support of the private sector, because it's, I repeat, is where there are the majority of the knowledge, the majority of the money, the investment. So um, the need, there is a need of uh, strict rules at the beginning of the partnership. So even though the investor won't of course make money, but there are different kinds of investors that is now is developing more and more. For example, there is, um, it's, it's surging like more and more what is called impact investment. Where investor, for example, they want of course um, their, uh, um, their money back, or at least a percentage of their money back of the investment, but it's not the only thing. They want an impact that can be social, environmental, um, etc. So that set of rules is something that should be done at the beginning of the partnerships. 
but I can I I can see that there is a really um a movement even in the in the investment sector that it's uh, started with the climate, but it's moving also into other sector. Um, that it's really like uh, trying to understand how to make an impact with investment of their of their money. Thank you. Um, okay. If we have still a few minutes, uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. No, I think no, but uh, if you have some questions, Valeria. And, uh, I would like yeah. to follow up on this last uh, answer, but yes. uh, really uh, shortly uh, about the impact and effect. So you were saying in your lecture that uh, the world is becoming increasingly complex. And uh, uh, in this sense, I think that uh, it is quite impossible no, to um, understand everything before acting uh, uh, in a complex setting uh, as the ones that you showed us. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, interdisciplinarity uh, is a, a fundamental tool uh, to increase the, the angles uh, of uh, perspective, to increase the knowledge, uh, um, to support uh, the, the project. But uh, uh, in a way, it is virtually impossible to have a sufficiently reliable projection of the effects of your project uh, in very complex setting. So my, my question is, uh, how do you assess uh, the effects, uh, for example, of a previous project uh, when uh, you start to undertake a new one? Yeah, like normally they all, uh, um, uh, all our projects are, uh, are following basically um, a, a monitoring and evaluation process. Um, so like we are monitoring like the um, during uh, the uh, the projects and after you do an evaluation and the evaluation is done uh, like uh, sometimes for certain part like together with the community and some other time from an external uh, from external um, you know um, monitoring evaluation expert. And like basically we are building reports on each project and we are trying to do to be as tough as possible to not repeat, of course, like the, the same error. Um, and, I, and I think it's also correct to say that, you know, not all our projects are perfect, you know, and, and it's very interesting to, of course, like internally, like to discuss what were you know the the, the error that we make, like when we didn't <clears throat> involve the, the community, um, where we involved too much the community, you know. So like where we didn't uh, um, put together when we forgot some stakeholder to sit at the table. All these things are are things that are part part of the process to to improve. Uh, um, uh, to improve the project. And always, especially, <clears throat> for example, in the Classroom for All initiative, being under the same umbrella, there will be, um, and looking at the same objective, there will be a lot of connection between the different projects we are doing. So in the project after, um, uh, the following process, actually, that's um, the one, for example, in Uganda, you know, it will be a big problem if they repeat the same error, because for sure there will be errors in the one in Uganda, because it's how it's work. It just, you know, like at the 100 classrooms that we are going to build, I hope that will be less and less error compared to the one that we will build in Uganda. But it need, you know, a really critical point of view that is not simple, uh, but um, it's always very good to work with uh, anthropologists into that because they, they, they are very good on, on criticize the process. Um, and, and this, you know, like dialogue, uh, it's, uh, um, it's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that we are right on time. For once.
for once. Uh, so again, uh, Michele, thank you so much for your lecture and uh, for your time, for answering all of our questions. And uh, we really hope to, to see you again soon, maybe in another um, occasion. Thank you, thank you to all of you. And um, I hope like uh, our work, it's, uh, it's, it's bringing uh, um, more than answer questions uh, to, to all of you. Uh, and I think it's really like what, what is needed uh, in, uh, in our field, but not just, uh, just in our field. Just really try to understand and uh, ask the, the right questions. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. 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 Ciao.